Welcome to Kitco News. I'm Niels Christensen. We're here at day two at the Silver Gold Summit in San Francisco. Joining me today is uh, Jeff Clark, uh, Senior Analyst at uh, GoldSilver.com. Thank you for uh, joining the show. It's great to be with you, Niels. Um, so you are uh, bullish on gold. What gets us past 1500? You think there's uh, a new bull market you know, we've sort of stalled. What gets us past? Well, there are a lot of catalysts that have pushed gold up to where they are now. We broke through that $1,400 ceiling, and now the $1,400 seems to be the floor. Mm -hmm. If you look at the quarterly re, um, price chart of gold going at, all the way back to 1975, the price chart looks almost identical to now as it did back in 2001 to 2003, the breakout. So from a technical standpoint, we have a breakout. When you have a breakout though, there's always ebb and flow, there's always back and fill. So uh, it's not surprising that gold came to be a little bit weaker uh, here recently. Uh, but when you think about it, the big catalysts that are out there that'll drive gold and silver higher haven't even begun to play out yet. Uh, so what do you mean by that? Like, what, what do you think is what do you think is the the big like is the big catalyst? I mean, can can uh, negative interest rates, which we saw, you know, drove gold higher this summer, can they go lower then? Negative interest rates? Yeah. Oh yeah, they could go lower. The, the amount of negative interest rate government bonds around the world with a negative yield will probably continue to grow. They, it keeps making record highs. That is a catalyst, and so is the geopolitical conflicts that are going on right now. That's a catalyst. But in the big picture, uh, debt has not been resolved. Our debt to GDP ratio is still above 100%. The debt can never be repaid, ever, in current US dollars. So there's a catalyst. It could be uh, the fact that we're printing money again. Uh, I think it's a little disingenuous to the Fed, for the Fed to say we're not printing money when in fact- It's organic growth. It's, it's, it's not QE, right. it's organic right. growth. Well, you can call it what you want, but it's, it's monetary dilution. There are currency issues as well. Uh, the G20, 18 of the 20 countries in the G20, the G20 is 85% of the global economy, still can't balance a budget a full decade after the financial crisis. This can't work, it's not sustainable. My point is there could be catalysts anywhere. They could come from any direction and hit us. And all of these things uh, are elevated. All these risks are elevated, and that's going to have consequences, and it's going to be very bullish for gold. I do think we are at, at the very cusp of a new bull market, but the big run-up is, is obviously yet to come. So what does this mean for gold and silver stocks? Um, uh, what do you like better? Gold uh, uh, producers or junior explorers? Well, before I would even buy a stock, I would make sure I own enough physical first because it, the type of fallout that could be ahead from any of these issues, and we haven't even talked about black swans. There could be a black swan out there. I would make sure I have a meaningful exposure to physical metal, gold and silver, before I bought a stock. Stocks are speculative. Um, I love them. I own a lot. But I know what I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with a speculation. Um, I think I'll be right about them, you know, yeah. but you never yeah. know. Um, so I, I would make sure I own gold and silver first. And then when it comes to the stocks, I am, since I have my safety net in place, uh, then now I'm ready to speculate. And to be quite frank, I don't own any producers. In fact, the only producer I own is First Majestic Silver, and that's because they have a very high leverage to the silver price. Uh, that's been demonstrated multiple times in, in their history. Uh, no company is perfect, but they clearly have a high leverage to uh, the silver price. So most of the gold stocks I own and silver stocks I own are developers, pre-producers, the explorers and prospect generators. Those haven't moved yet, right? All that much. Uh, but that's not unusual. First you have gold and silver move, historically, and then after that you have uh, the producers will move, mm -hmm. and then you go on down the line. So, so you're you're not worried. I mean, we've seen a you know a, a major rally in gold. Uh, you know, up six uh, up uh, uh, sixteen percent. Uh, we haven't seen the explorers move, but you're just saying it's it's a matter of time. It is a matter of time. If you believe this, we're on the cusp of a new bull market, and I do believe that. So, 
eventually these will move. All boats rise in a, in a major bull market, uh, but I think you don't want to play that. I think you want to, if you're going to be in stocks, uh, you want to try to pick the best ones you can. And the thing is, we can actually identify who the better companies are right now because there's not that many of them. And on the junior side, we know that majors are going to need them. They're going to need uh, to buy more ounces because they haven't been exploring uh, very much. Reserves are down. There's a lot of stats on this that everyone has <laughs> talked about, you know. But uh, they're going to need to buy quality assets. Uh, high-grade assets, large assets. When you put that criteria in front of your computer, you can identify who those companies are. And so that's where I'm heavily invested. And at some point, uh, they're going to uh, you know, look at these companies and want to own them. Um, last question. Uh, you say own gold before uh, gold equities. Uh, how much gold should you hold? And I ask this because the report came out, I can't remember um, who it was, but a report came out saying that actually you should be holding maybe 20 to 30 percent above the, sort of the, the norm of 5 to 10 percent. Right. Um, how much gold do you think a, an average investor should be having with all of the dark clouds sort of forming? Right, that's a great question. Because risks are so elevated in many segments of our society, with our, our currency, um, geopolitical, economic, uh, there's so many risks out there. Because of that, in my opinion, this is a time to be overweight precious metals, to be overweight gold and silver, own more than you normally would. So if you own 5%, you gotta own 10%. If you own 10%, you need to own 20%. Um, and some people, let's be honest, maybe shouldn't be buying stocks themselves because there's always these horror stories of people that lose money in bull markets, right? Because they take too much risk or uh, they, they do too much trading or they just buy the wrong companies. So some people maybe ought to just consider buying gold and silver because gold and silver are usually defense, but in the next bull market, they're actually going to play offense. And I think you're gonna make money on gold and silver itself. And that's a, a, a much lower risk way to play this. Uh, but the point is, I think for now, this is a time to be overweight precious metals. We've done long-term historical studies on this and shown that a, a, ten, a, a portfolio with 10% of gold in it performs better than any portfolio with less gold in it. So 10% is a magic number to start with. If you don't have 10% of your investable assets in gold, I think you don't have enough. Um, wow, that's uh, fantastic comments. Thank you very much, Chef. Thank you, Niels. It was great to be us. with you. Excellent. Thank you for watching Kiko.com. Stay tuned for more coverage from the Silver Gold Summit.